thanks so much. So I'm going to start with two apologies one for not being able to make it here on Monday. Um, and, uh, and to make up for it, sort of my second apology is that I have, I've made my talk fairly pedagogical, keeping in mind the students. So I apologize to all the experts. Uh, you will really know a lot of the stuff that I'm going to talk about. Um, so um, I'm going to tell you about uh, some work that we did uh, a few years ago now, uh, looking for these uh, chimera states in mechanical oscillator networks. Um, but the, the whole thing, I want to start off really with uh, with process of synchronization and, and a story, really. So this um, this is James, uh, James Murray. Um, uh, he, he was a person who led the, the development of the Oxford English Dictionary. So you can see his, uh, his team uh, back over there uh, compiling words and their meanings from various different sources and putting together this, uh, this dictionary. Um, why do I bring this up uh, is because at the time that they felt the need for this Oxford English Dictionary, um, so I'm taking uh, a lot of this from, from a very nice book called The Surgeon of Crota on the story of this Oxford English Dictionary. Um, at the time, it was felt that uh, there was really no guide uh, to, uh, to help us through these wide sea of words. Um, no grammar, no dictionary. Um, and that was one of the reasons why they felt the need to have a dictionary in the first place. Um, and uh, indeed, the case was made, uh, so to speak, by, uh, by invoking what the physicists had been uh, able to do. Um, uh, and uh, the case really goes like so, saying that language should be accorded the same dignity and respect as other standards the science was at the time also defining. For example, physicists were getting uh, very organized with their things, we figuring out um, uh, colors, you know, various properties of matter, and so on. A very important point that, that is brought up here is about the measurement of the longitude of a ship, right? Um, enormous efforts were being made in that particular direction. A board of longitude had been set up by the government, funds were being dispersed, just so that a clock could be invented which would go on the sea on a ship. Um, and the idea was to make this clock imperceptibly accurate. Right? So really, measurement of longitude was uh, at the time tied to this, uh, tied to this ability to make a very, very precise clock. Yeah? Um, and this was, this was an effort that occupied, occupied the mind of um, a, a very famous scientist, Christian Huygens, uh, back in the 1600s already now. Uh, so he himself was already trying uh, to design uh, more and more precise clocks to aid in the, in, um, in the measurement of, of this longitude, right? And in his experiments um, to design better and better clocks was when he made this observation, really, uh, of the phenomenon of spontaneous synchrony. Um, and uh, he had a very nice experimental setup that he built uh, with, his, with his pendulum clocks, which were hung from a wooden beam. So what he initially noticed was that uh, two of the clocks that he was developing hung off a wall uh, would eventually sort of synchronize and, and, the, and the pendula would come into antiphase motion. Uh, and he had described this in a letter to his father saying, uh, that he that he sees a an odd sympathy between uh, these clocks um, as they synchronize, and in his careful experiments, he realized that it was indeed the mechanical vibrations that were communicated by this mechanical beam from uh, clock to clock that eventually led to their synchronization. So I thought um, I'll just go through a uh, another simple. Uh, set up very similar in spirit to first uh, discuss this issue of synchronization um, and then I will lead on with this very same setup to look for the canvas. Okay, so, um, so in place of um, the clocks that, that uh, Huygens initially had, uh, the setup that we consider over here are two mechanical pendula, so-called metronomes. 
Um, the frequency of these metronomes can be changed by moving a counterweight, which is attached over here, up and down this pendulum, uh, this lever arm. Uh, and in this particular case, two of these metronomes are situated on a board. The board itself is situated on two uh, uh, Coca-Cola or soda cans. The idea is that uh, this entire board itself can move, right? Um, so the so each individual oscillator is itself described by the motion of it is described by something like a Van der Poel oscillator, um, and the coupling to the board comes because of the momentum transfer from from this mass to the board, the big board itself, where the x is the position of of the of of this big board plus the cans. Okay, so uh, looking at, looking at uh, the equations of motion for two of them, you will realize uh, that these two oscillators are coupled to each other. So this is really the coupling term for each of the oscillators. And the coupling is coming through the motion uh, of the board. The motion of the board itself um, is captured as a combination um, Oh, sorry, the strength with which they're coupled to each other is really a combination of the various masses in the system. And if you will uh, also notice that there is the natural frequency um, of the pendulum itself that comes in uh, to this coupling strength. Um, so there are two nice ways to tune the coupling uh, as suggested by this, which is one is to change simply the, the mass of this board, and the other one, of course, you change it in a nonlinear way, but to also change simply uh, the frequency of, of the pendula themselves. Right? Okay, um, just to very quickly go through uh, the, the sort of heuristics uh, of why this can uh, synchronize at all, uh, let's look at um, these very same equations rewritten in, um, in terms of the difference and the sum of the phase angles of these uh, oscillators, uh, so of the amplitudes of these oscillators, right? Uh, so you will immediately notice that um, the coupling term, the coupling strength, comes in the ev evolution of the sum of the phases, indicating that when they are in phase with each other, you, they're coupled, and when they're antiphase with each other, they're effectively decoupled. Well, of course, they're coupled to each other. I mean, these two are coupled equations, but um, you will see that this is an effective, uh, it, it really doesn't depend so, uh, on the motion of the board itself. Um, okay. Uh, and when these, uh, when these phase angles, uh, uh, when these amplitudes are similar, in other words, the oscillators are closed to synchrony, you will uh, again immediately realize that this equation decouples from, from that one by virtue of this going to zero. Uh, and uh, again, you will simply see uh, that, that uh, you, you get a constant um, oscillation for this in-phase mode in terms of the motion of the board itself. And this antiphase component uh, decays. Right? So even if you start them off in antiphase, initially uh, this will quickly decay and the system itself settles uh, into, the, into the synchronized uh, state. Okay, um, again, sort of this, this was really, uh, uh, you know, keeping the students in mind and to go through a little bit of the pedagogical details. Um, so, so one knows that... Uh, one knows to expect one knows to expect oscillatory solutions uh, to these oscillators, uh, and one can uh, one can then derive the, the amplitude phase equations by uh, by just using you know separation of time scales uh, associated in this problem, um, and one can describe the the motion associated with the amplitude uh, the evolution associated with the amplitude of the two oscillators uh, and their phases. Uh, in fact, uh, in the equation that I've written over here, uh, uh, or 
I should have pointed out this reference. It's a very nice paper. Jim Pantaleone has done this. Uh, um, written down really the difference in the phase angles um, of these oscillators. Um, and going through a bit of uh, calculation, one realizes that the difference in the phases um, evolves like so, right? Where uh, you will already see from, see from here that if the coupling is sufficiently strong, um, you will, you will, the, the oscillators will synchronize in phase. Um, and uh, you will also realize that there is a, um, there is a uh, coupling kernel, if you will, between the two oscillators, which depends on the difference in the, in the phase angles of the oscillator. Right? And if you go through uh, a similar analysis um, where you have uh, n oscillators um, in place of just two, one can, one can again write down the amplitude and the phase equations um, of, these, of this uh, entire system. Um, and uh, in this case, if one goes through the same, uh, same process uh, that, that one uh, does over here in order to get this relationship, one gets a relationship that looks like so, where you have the phase of each individual oscillator evolving with some, one can think of this as an effective um, frequency uh, of, of each individual pendulum, now which comes because of its own inherent frequency and because of the coupling with, with the entire population. Uh, sorry, uh, this one. And then you have each individual oscillator is then coupled now to the sum of this, um, uh, of this phase difference uh, uh, kernel, if you will, right? Um, and now this will immediately remind Many of you, this of to this uh, of this Kuramoto model, um, so you can directly see the similarities over here. And um, in fact, this Kuramoto model has this uh, phase transition uh, to synchrony at critical coupling strength, and the metronome system also displays a similar transition to synchrony uh, as you vary this coupling parameter. And I told you earlier that you can, you can change this coupling parameter in two ways. One is to systematically reduce the mass of this board, or you can systematically increase the frequency of the oscillators itself, and, um, and the entire system then makes a transition from this desynchronized region to a synchronized region. And I'm sure, um, again, a lot of you have seen a video that uh, that looks something like this, just to make this point clear. So now, um, instead of having two metronomes, what you're seeing here are many, many more. They're all sitting on a board that the board itself can move side to side. Um, and you've seen that all these oscillators have been started off uh, in a random order. And if you will notice very carefully this, the position of one of these letters, and I'll try to hold my point as still as possible, you'll see that the board itself starts to move from side to side. Um, and you will also see some pockets of oscillators that come into synchrony. Um, and indeed, if one waits long enough, all of these uh, oscillators synchronize, and now you can see that the amplitude of the board is quite significant, um, and, um, and it is this motion of the board itself that leads to the synchronization. Okay? Fine. So, um, now, uh, just to discuss this Kuramoto model a little bit and to, and to go into the chimeras, um, if one considers um, that this coupling strength or the coupling kernel uh, is democratic and you have either a mean field global coupling uh, 
or you have, and if you include space, and if you have some kind of just nearest neighbor coupling in both these sort of extreme cases, um, one expects that beyond a, a critical coupling strength, uh, the population will transition to synchrony. Um, but this, this sort of uh, changed when, uh, the, in this idea of this democratic coupling leading to synchrony in the population was challenged by this very interesting study in 2002 by Kuramoto, where they, where they considered a ring of these phase oscillators, the, Kuramo, the model on a ring, uh, and the coupling strength, the coupling kernel, depended uh, on the distance from the oscillators, like so. And uh, what they found was that on this ring, they found two domains. Um, one domain of oscillators, so what you're seeing here is the oscillator phase, and each, uh, each individual oscillator is a point on this x-axis. Um, so what they observed were, were these two domains, uh, one which was perfectly synchronized, uh, and there was a large uh, enough domain where the oscillators uh, did not synchronize, and these two coexisted on this, on this ring. Uh, in um, subsequent analysis, um, it was Abrams and, and, uh, and Strogatz that um, referred to this coexistence of synchrony and uh, asynchrony as a chimera. Um, and since, uh, since the original discovery and this analysis, uh, this sort of took on mythic proportions uh, um, and extensively studied. Now there are a lot, a lot more references, and this is sort of a dated talk. But um, there's a lot of, a uh, lot of um, analytical work uh, on these chimera states. Um, but I'll point out to you the main features uh, of of many of these different studies. Uh, the, the, these these chimera states occur in a variety of settings and are quite quite robust. What do I mean by robust? Uh, first, uh, in a variety of settings, so various different um, oscillator systems, in various uh, network topologies, um, uh, these chimera states were, were found. Um, and by robust, I mean that they were robust to differences in or heterogeneities in the frequencies of the oscillators uh, to the connectivity on these networks, uh, to the coupling strengths, and, uh, and also throw in some noise into the system, uh, these states persisted. Okay, um, and back when we were, we got interested in this, uh, this was really, this was really the state um, of the field at the time, and what bothered me as an experimentalist was the lack of an experiment in which these, these were seen. Um, right? Um, and, and so, in order to build an experiment, I'll describe to you a simple hierarchical network uh, in, in which these chimera states are found, uh, which will kind of lead us on to the experiment itself. Again, um, uh, this, this uh, uh, division into populations and, and this study was, uh, was due to Abrams and Strogatz, where they considered two populations of oscillators, which are coupled to each other weakly. Um, and in the absence of this coupling, each population uh, is capable of, of uh, synchronizing. And uh, in this configuration, what they found as this chimera state was one population which was perfectly synchronized and the other population which uh, remained desynchronized. Uh, and, and of course, this is, uh, this is Symmetric. Um, ah, sorry. So, I, in, in this, the initial conditions were broken symmetry initial conditions, right? Um, uh, so, in other words, it, it it stayed with what what you started the system with. Uh, there have been also um, other studies in the meantime. Where, yeah. Okay. Um, so 
then came these two, what I have put in quote unquote as experiments around this time. Uh, one was the realization of these uh, chimera states in chemical oscillators uh, by the group of Ken Showalter. Um, uh, so what they did was to have these colloidal beads. The colloidal beads carried the catalyst for the belusov zabotinsky reaction. Um, and um, those of you who know about this belusov zabotinsky reaction know that the catalyst changes changes color, red and uh, uh, blue, I mean, uh, it changes color and which you can use to keep track of the oscillation. And these beads themselves were immersed in the bath of the, of the BZ chemistry and they divided the set of beads into two groups. Um, and what they also had in this experiment was a belusov zabotinsky reaction mixture which could be controlled by light. Okay, and uh, so the track of the oscillations of one group via a camera, and through a computer-controlled feedback, they would they would shine light on the other uh, uh, to affect the coupling on the other group. And what they found indeed was the the one group that they had started off synchronized stayed synchronized, and the other group was desynchronized, remained desynchronized. They realized the chimera state. The other experiment, uh, the group of Raj Roy, etc., uh, what they did was they had a spatial light modulator, an array of pixels, uh, and the intensity of the pixel um, was what was the oscillator. Um, and again, through a computer control feedback, they implemented a coupling kernel between these oscillators, which then allowed them to realize this one region of this panel where all the pixels stayed synchronized and the other region of the panel where they were desynchronized. And this was, um, I mean, these studies came out at the same time we were working on ours, but when they did come out, I was slightly disappointed in the sense that there is still a computer in these experiments that, uh, that does this feedback mechanism. Of course, there's the noise of the real world uh, that, that they have put in. Um, and, and beyond the fact that one has implemented the, the, computer, the, the coupling kernel in the computer, uh, it didn't give much more insight into the, me the mechanics uh, of the state itself. So um, what we decided to do was to build a purely uh, mechanical experiment to realize uh, these chimera states. Um, and uh, what you've already seen um, in the videos earlier, is a population of metronomes that were sitting on a board that could move. So we just built two of those populations and coupled the two populations with the spring. Right? Um, our experiment looks like that. So um, we have two aluminum boards. The alumi so there's a slight difference to what you saw earlier. Uh, earlier, the board was sitting on a set of wheels that could move. In this case, this board is connected uh, by these lever arms to a pivot, so it actually forms a swing. And on these swings, we have uh, 15 metronomes uh, that are sitting. And above this pivot point, this lever arm extends, and we connected springs to these lever arms. And by just simply moving them up and down, one can fine tune the coupling strength between, uh, between the two oscillators. And on each, on each metronome, we have a little piece of paper which we painted uh, in UV, uh, UV paint and did the entire experiment in, um, in dark light so that we could track the positions of the metronomes. Um, and we also track the positions of the board itself. Right? Okay, so when the, when the spring is sufficiently stiff, the coupling is sufficiently stiff, it's really like having one big population, and that's what you're seeing over there. The, both the populations are synchronized and they're going in phase with each other. When the spring is sufficiently weak, each population synchronizes, but, and there's an antiphase relationship between the two populations. 
And somewhere in between, we find this uh, symmetry broken state uh, where one population is synchronized and the other remains desynchronized. And we tried a variety of initial conditions in this experiment. One where, you know, we start off like that and it remains like so. And we also tried where we started them off uh, both desynchronized, in which case one of them would come to synchrony and the other would remain desynchronized. Okay. Um, and we can then, by tracking the positions of these oscillators, extract the phase angles by using a Hilbert transform on this, on this time series. And you can see that the phases of all these oscillators are nicely bunched up together while the desynchronized population um, is, is spread around this phase circle. And uh, looking at the order parameter also, this one is perfectly synchronized, whereas this one describes sort of a, a cloud uh, with, an ampli with a magnitude less than one. Uh, so, and, and for as long as this experiment lasts, which is a few thousand oscillation cycles, uh, this is the situation. Right? So indeed, we have this chimera state. Just to sort of summarize uh, what you just saw in the movies, uh, we, as we decrease this spring stiffness or spring coupling, we go from this in-phase state of the two oscillators to the anti-phase state of the two oscillators through this chimera state. Um, and if one keeps track of the, the frequency of these oscillators, one, one sees that uh, the frequencies of the oscillators, now remember that these are amplitude phase or large amplitude oscillators, uh, the frequencies uh, differ significantly from what we initially set on uh, nominally on the pendulum itself. Um, we've of course seen these these before, the in and the antiphase. So if you take two pendula and couple them by the spring, you know that these are the eigen modes of of the system. So uh, then, sort of to ask the question, where where do these chimera states live in relation to these um, to these eigen modes of the system that we know? Uh, I told you earlier. Uh, by changing the metronome frequency, one can change the, the coupling within the population. And by changing the spring stiffness, we're changing the coupling between the populations. And looking at this bifurcation diagram, you see that sitting at one particular frequency, one traverses through this antiphase mode into this in-phase mode through a large region which spans these, these chimera states. There's a region of um, bistability between this antiphase and the chimera mode. Um, there is a thin sliver um, where both populations remain desynchronized, irrespective of the initial conditions. And uh, this chimera region itself coincides with the antiphase uh, eigen mode of the system. Um, so, meaning. Uh, uh, the frequency of the oscillators corresponds to the antiphase uh, frequency of, of the swings plus the springs. Okay? Um, and it's also bounded by the eigenfrequency where one swing doesn't move at all, but you have one swing plus, plus the spring. Uh, okay? So really this region over here is chimeras plus a whole zoo of uh, other states. Uh, but before telling you that, what this setup really has done is, uh, in, in some ways, it has extended the Pantaleone experiment by coupling it with the uh, two populations. And in some ways, it has generalized the Huygens experiment in that each big os clock or pendulum is now broken down into uh, many degrees of freedom or many individual oscillators, right? And so you will immediately recognize the Pantaleone um, uh, equations that you saw earlier for our setup, except now we have this extra coupling uh, between, the two, the, between the two swings uh, that, that we have, right? And it is indeed this uh, 
multiple degrees of freedom now in this system that gives rise to the big zoo of states that we see. Uh, I'm just going to show you one example of what we see in experiment, um, other, than the, uh, other than the chimera state that you saw earlier, where the order parameter, um, and I'll come to this in a moment, uh, had really no structure. The time evolution of the order parameter really had no structure. Whereas over here, you will see that I'm plotting the magnitude of this order parameter. This is the synchronized population that stays at one. And the desynchronized population you see has these periodic oscillations. And if you look closer into what that desynchronized population is doing, it is broken into many clusters. And so there is there's what I've labeled C underscore cluster number. So there's a cluster which sits perfectly antiphase with the synchronized population. There's a cluster, there are two clusters, okay, maybe I, maybe I look uh, at the order parameters to describe this a little better. So what you're seeing over here uh, are the order parameters just calculated within the cluster, right, in relation to the synchronized population. So you see that this cluster, the, one of the clusters just remains in antiphase relationship with the synchronized population. There is, there is a cluster that is very close to the in-phase, uh, I mean, it's very close to being in-phase with this population. There are two, two clusters, C3 and C4, that just keep rotating on, uh, rotating here. But between themselves, they have an antiphase relationship, right? So they're really going like this around the circle together. And all of this together gives rise to that complicated um, stuff. And we have explored um, that region a little bit more in the simulations, um, where we vary this coupling strength um, systematically. So here we have 64 oscillators in our simulations. So as we increase this stiffness, this cloud bifurcates off this antiphase mode. So you will see that still there is really no, st no structure um, in this um, order parameter until it reaches a place where you know, it even uh, turns into a limit cycle and one gets this so-called breathing chimera. Um, where the order parameter oscillates. Um, what I'm showing you here, what, I, uh, what I'm showing you here really is not quite a situation where there are clusters within. Right? So this is, this is also quite distinct from that. And eventually uh, it collapses uh, into this, uh, this in-phase mode. And before it collapses, we always found that there are there's a state where there's one oscillator that, that remains uh, out of uh, sync from the remaining population, really giving rise to this kind of uh, an observation. Okay, um, very quickly. Um, yeah, because I also want to keep some time for questions. Um, we extended this in a subsequent, um, subsequent work where we where we added an inertia term, again, inspired by the experiment that we had just done, to the original model of uh, Abrams, where one doesn't have this. Um, and in, in, so this is now just a phase model with inertia, right? Um, so we, we capture, so what you're seeing uh, here is experiment, and here is, is from this model. Uh, just to very quickly describe what you're seeing, one is this state that you've already seen where, you know, um, this is the, cla the, the, the chimera state. This is this breathing chimera state, and this disordered phase, which we capture in both of both the experiment and this very simple model. But what's the interesting feature that I wanted to point out to you uh, is this intermittency that we get uh, in, this, in this model as we increase uh, the inertia uh, in the model. So if looking at one of these, these time traces for the desynchronized population, 
uh, you will see that there are periods uh, of there are long periods where this order parameter stays close to one. And um, indeed, this happens in a very intermittent fashion. We calculated these Lyapunov exponents. Um, and you will see that beyond a certain, certain mass is when this population turns, uh, turns chaotic in the first place. Uh, and indeed, this region is laminar in the sense that uh, so the Lyapunov exponent over there is the, the, the local uh, exponent is zero. Um, but if you look at the distribution of the exponents in the population, uh, one sees more or less a Gaussian distribution except for this strong peak which corresponds indeed to these laminar regions. Um, and if one looks at the, the probability uh, strength of the of the probability of this peak, it, it has something that looks like a power law with the number of oscillators indicating indeed in the thermodynamic limit uh, that these laminar phases disappear. Ah, sorry, so the first plot, so this is the Lyapunov exponent as we change the mass, the largest, the largest Lyapunov exponent as we change the mass, right? Um, and so one is where we can, so, the red is where we considered um, broken uh, symmetry initial conditions, and the black is where we considered the symmetric initial conditions. Yeah. Okay, so that really uh, uh, is all I wanted to say, but I wanted to thank the people that, that I worked with. So, uh, Eric Martin's um, was a postdoc with Oscar Halacek in Göttingen uh, when I myself was a PhD student. And all of this really started because of my initial discussions with, uh, with Eric. Uh, Antoine was another postdoc who joined um, us in building this experiment. The later part, uh, the this, this second thing that I described to you with, with these uh, intermittent camera states was done mainly by Simona uh, and Alessandro, uh, where Eric and me participated. Thanks so much. Very interesting uh, experimental study and result. And please, questions. Somebody have a question. In your experiment, uh, you have two families of uh, oscillators, right? Now, um, just a few questions about the geometry that you've used. Um, these are almost as like in arrays, right? I mean, ah. and but they, you know, so question one is, have you done them in this order? Must have. Um, then the uh, related question is, do they always have, you know, the same behavior per tray? So each tray is synchronized or uh, uh, desynchronized? De because in your, in the 32 uh, experiment, we saw that there were some which were in phase and some which were anti phase. So, is there disorder within uh, the tray family as well? Right. And uh, the last question is what's the smallest number of uh, oscillators that you can put on yeah, and see something sensible? Yeah. Um, so, to the first question, indeed, we tried to mix them up um, and none of it changes simply because we have a rigid board below. Um, and we had to arrange them in, in an array so that we could track them. It was just the convenience of tracking. Um, to your second question, um, if, if the state that started off persisted, um, indeed it persisted, meaning that if there was a clustered state, it would remain clustered through the course of the experiment. Uh, if there was no structure, it would remain without any structure. But there was something curious that we observed, which we didn't report in the paper and haven't followed up. But um, I think this is quite interesting. So what we have here are these, are these metal springs, which are very, lin which are very precise and linear. Um, in the beginning of the experiment, we had here instead rubber bands. And when we had the rubber bands, um, what we found was that the symmetry would keep switching back and forth. Right, so the synchronized population would switch to the other side and, and so on. 
Um, so, um, and your last question was the minimal. Yeah. So we tried it two. So we we tried it with uh, one oscillator per plate, and we were able to get you know uh, this this phase diagram, antiphase, in phase, and this thin slice where they remain desynchronized. And when we did it with two, we started to see the two oscillators being desynchronized between themselves, right? So, if, is it the minimal? I don't know. <laughs> but we indeed saw something that was desynchronized. OK, maybe other question? Oh, yes. I mean, and uh, uh, the other kind of chaotic. So the residence time in each of the states, uh -huh. have you calculated and what kind of distribution are they exhibit? Ah, we have not looked at the residence, uh, residence times uh, itself. Uh, but um, what, we, what we did was to look, uh, no, we didn't do the residence time. Uh, we have done, I mean, we looked with the number of oscillators and so on. Um, yeah. It changes. I mean, it changes. Yes, with the mass, more. with the mass and the number, mm -hmm. uh, it changes indeed. Thank you. There's a question. Sir, hello. Yeah. I think that uh, your experiment is based on uh, uh, frequency synchronization and amplitude behavior. Means, uh, and the same phenomena is seen uh, when we talk about the resonance. Is all the your uh, these oscillators when get synchronized and then there is a hike in the amplitude. So, I mean, how does it uh, differ from the resonance phenomenon? It's just uh, indeed we are very close to resonance for these chimera states, right? So, as I pointed out in this phase diagram, uh, the oscillators uh, are at this antiphase eigenfrequency, right? So, indeed. The, these chimeras appear near this resonance. So just, just like Sir uh, mentioned uh, regarding the geometry of the placement of these uh, mm -hmm. uh, oscillators, so uh, is it possible that uh, it has an, uh, an effect on the amplitude if we um, uh, change the placements of these um, oscillators? Uh, perhaps, but we didn't do any careful study of, of that. What we just confirmed was that, you know, we were not uh, biasing the system in any way by putting it in an array, oh. right? Uh, in fact, the fact that this um, plate is rigid means that it doesn't really matter how we place them. It's only the frequency of the oscillators and how close that frequency is to this eigenmode that matters. Yes, uh, this resonance puts a constraint that, okay, only uh, the frequency of oscillation should be synchronized with all the, all the oscillators. But uh, it, it does not mention that whether it should be uh, lined up or non-aligned. So this is the main, main question that if we uh, misalign all these oscillators, and still if we see uh, the different cases, means uh, having a synchronization or desynchronization frequency, then what is the effect on the ultimate um, amplitude? Because this may lead to a practical applications also, like uh, uh, soldiers, Moving on the bridge, they are asked to uh, move with the synchronized movement so that uh, amplitude does not increase all these things. The position doesn't matter, but if we indeed change the frequencies within the uh, population, that matters. Oh, short question. Between the uh, symmetries of the chimera state with the variation of the parameters. Like in Not a in this setup. Okay. In this setup, we didn't see this switching from one population to other. No. Okay. Yeah. I think it takes a nonlinear coupling to do this. Yeah. Yeah, so shunt the place. Because it's